Hallo, hallo, alle da. Ich glaube, fast alle einige Gäste kommen noch. Ich hoffe, die nehmen da noch selbstständig Platz. Mein Name ist Bert Antonius Kaufmann, ich bin der kaufmännische Direktor von den Deichtwald und Vertreter heute Abend Dirk Lucko, der leider erkrankt ist. Also erstmal ein herzliches Willkommen an Sie alle zu diesem wahnsinnig spannenden Abend. Als Deichtorhalle freuen wir uns auch so sehr darauf und auch auf die Gespräche. Und zuallererst a warm welcome and a happy applause to Tom Sachs. Yes. This space program is a 13-year journey of discovery into the frontiers of other worlds. Und wir haben diese Other Worlds hier in den Deichtorn seit September ungeheuer genossen. Also wir haben wahnsinnig viele glückliche Besucher gehabt. Es war eine one of the best exhibitions in Deichtorhallen. Wir hatten 55.000 Besucher, die hier hingekommen sind. Wir hatten unglaublich viele glückliche Familien mit Kindern, die hier äh, sich wirklich im besten Sinne austoben konnten und ganz viele künstlerische Ergebnisse mitgenommen haben. Also dieser Abend ist jetzt in unserer letzten Ausstellungswoche wirklich nochmal das absolute Highlight. Und wir müssen nochmal einen Applaus machen. Der Tom Sachs hat nämlich, ist nicht nur selber ein great artist, he has a wonderful team. And we should give you a team, and he's a, he is a very big team, and it's all around here. We should give the team an applause. Okay? <lacht> Neben Tom Sachs äh, begrüße ich sehr herzlich heute Abend Friederike Herr, die äh, das Künstlergespräch hier moderieren wird. Friederike Herr ist seit zehn Jahren Redakteurin und Moderatorin bei Byte FM. Ich glaub, hoffe und äh, denke, das kennen Sie alle. Byte FM sitzt in diesem wahnsinnig spannenden Bunker in St. Pauli. Und äh, Frau Herr macht als Musikerin, Festivalorganisatorin, Grimme-Preis ausgezeichnete Journalistin, unglaublich viele spannende Dinge und ist bei uns fester Partner unseres Deichtorhallen-Podcasts. Wer den noch nicht gehört hat, bitte unbedingt damit anfangen, wo es immer unglaublich schöne Dinge über Kunst und Hintergründe und neueste Erkenntnisse gibt. Die Reihe heißt Das ist Kunst und da ist eben heute Abend auch ähm, diese, dieses Gespräch mit aufgezeichnet. Dann begrüße ich, ohne dem wäre es gar nicht möglich gewesen, unseren Hauspartner EY. Ich weiß, dass einige Gäste schon hier sind von EY. Und äh, diese Ausstellung, ich habe gesagt, ist eine der bestbesuchten. Es ist auch eine der teuersten. Also wenn Sie sowas machen, äh, liegen Sie zwischen ein bis zwei Millionen. Ich bin der kaufmännische Direktor, deswegen darf ich sowas verraten. Es ist ein wahnsinniges Ding. Und der Künstler hat wahnsinnig toll geholfen, aber eben viele andere auch und viele Hauspartner und EY gehört damit zu. Und EY hat auch eine Reihe erfunden, die wir jetzt bei den Deichtorhallen seit mehreren Jahren machen. Corona-bedingt war das da ja etwas ruhiger. Die heißt Talking About Art. Und heute Abend ist ein wunderbarer Abend mit Talking About Art. Und ich bitte jetzt Tom Sex und Friederike Herr hier auf die Bühne, dass wir Talking About Art machen. Also, herzlich willkommen und nochmal einen Applaus. So, hört man mich schon? Auf dem Mikrofon? Ja, hört sich so an. Super. Ja, schönen guten Abend. Ich sage noch mal kurz ein paar Worte zu dem Künstler, der hier neben mir sitzt, Tom Sachs. Tom Sachs wurde 1966 in New York geboren. Er studierte Architektur in London, arbeitete zwei Jahre für den Architekten Frank Gehry in Los Angeles. In den 90ern kehrte er dann wieder in seine Heimatstadt New York zurück und gründete da sein mittlerweile, muss man sagen, legendäres Studio, von wo aus er dann seine Karriere als Künstler begann. Seine unverwechselbare DIY-Ästhetik und selbstironischen Inszenierungen haben Sex aber nicht nur in der Kunstwelt bekannt gemacht. Vor allem auf den einschlägigen Social-Media-Plattformen hat der Künstler viele Fans, die sich seiner Vision zugehörig fühlen. Hier in den Deichtorhallen sehen und erleben wir aktuell noch und seit September Tom Sachs Space Program Rare Earths, seltene Erden. Diese vierte Ausstellung in Sachs Space Programm ist Teil einer 2007 gestarteten Erkundungsreise, die sich nach Mond, Mars und Europa jetzt den Asteroiden Vesta zum Ziel genommen hat. Ein Raumfahrtprogramm aus Sperrholz, Heißklebepistole, 
Pappe, Hammer, Nägeln handgemacht und in vielen Dingen von dem der NASA nicht zu unterscheiden. Das Space-Programm von Tom Sachs wird mit einer Space-Mission zu Four Vesta, dem hellsten Asteroiden, der von der Erde aus sichtbar ist, schließen. Und zwar übermorgen am Samstag, den 9. April um 10 Uhr. Mit Tom Sachs will ich jetzt vor allem darüber sprechen, wer ist er eigentlich, wer ist dieser Künstler, was sind seine Strategien, denn es gibt da tatsächlich Strategien, die er verfolgt. Zehn Gebote, würde ich fast schon sagen, seine Ten Bullets. Sein Studio, seine Einflüsse, Rituale und Surfen. Und natürlich das Space-Programm und die Space-Mission, die uns am Samstag noch hier erwartet. Tom, it's good to sit on the stage with you. Yeah. Thanks, Frederica. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the intro. You started building and recreating objects with what was in front of you at a very young age, as a kid. Um, the story of you building a Nikon camera for your dad out of clay because he couldn't afford to buy that camera is uh, widely told about you and getting into your art. But what do you think drew your young child self to create? What, work with the material that you had available? What do you think was that initial impulse? Well, I, I, it was a, I think I was just like everybody else. The reason why the story is maybe worth telling is because I kept doing it for 50 years or something. Um, I made a camera out of clay in art class and I wasn't particularly gifted. My sister was a better artist than, than I, I was. And, um, I made this camera for my dad because he couldn't afford the Nikon one. He got the Olympus one. And um, later, by the way, that camera got handed down to me when I was in high school. I was the yearbook photographer. So I kind of got the camera eventually and sold it for rent money later when I was a starving artist. Um, I. But I, I think the strategy of making something because I wanted it, I kept doing. And I mean, that's what you're seeing in front of you today. I, I, I wanted my own space program and everything else, so just made it. And that strategy we call sympathetic magic, anthropological term, sort of like a voodoo doll, or if you build it, yeah. they, they will come. Um, but maybe my, my favorite example is the ex voto, which is um, uh, uh, like a a symbol, like a, a, an arm, if your arm hurts, you make a model of your arm and you bring it to your religious practitioner who helps you bring um, uh, feelings of healing towards it. And what we know about health is if you believe you will heal, you might. And if you believe you won't heal, you won't. So I, I think it's, a, it's not a guarantee, but it's aiming you in the right direction. Yeah, I remember this, reading this quote of yours uh, where you say that you had a very unsuccessful childhood or yeah. teenagehood. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so you kind of had to create your own standards of excellence, your own framework in which you could uh, be who you wanted yeah. to be, if I understand that right. Yeah. I, was very, I was bad at school, bad at sports, and uh, low self-esteem, getting in fights, and... and um, had but had parents that were very loving and they, they hired tutors to help me um, get better at math and a psychiatrist, child psychiatrist to figure out why I was so fucked up. And, um, but eventually one, one psychiatrist said that, that, I, that I might outgrow it once I find my own internal standards of excellence, which I found through sculpture just by chance. Making it is a way of having it is something you also tend to say and, and I feel like that's what you were trying to do with that Nikon camera that you made out of clay for your dad because he couldn't have it, you know, he can buy it. And uh, also you made uh, a, a dub version, what you call it, of a yeah. Mondrian yeah. painting. S similarly, when I left school and moved to New York, I wanted a Mondrian. I saw the, the famous show at the Museum of Modern Art of like, I don't know, 1995 or something, 97, 93. I don't remember the year, but it was a big survey. And I loved them, but I didn't think it was authentic. Is this okay that I'm telling the story? Is this, yeah. yeah. I didn't think it was an authentic use of my time to go down to Wall Street, make a lot of money so I could buy a Mondrian. 
Um, so I made my own, but it wasn't a forgery. I didn't use paint, I used tape because the material that, I, that I'm more proficient at and... There's I, people that recreate your Mondrian on the internet. Did you know oh, that? Oh, no, I did not. Yeah. In tape? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great, see? <laughs> um, but, but the thing that the full circle is that, so I made a Mondrian, I hung it in my studio, and I thought that's pretty cool of a Mondrian now. And I've been using that strategy for 30 years. And um, I realized that I, I, I'm not really into stuff anymore. Like, I've made everything. It's like um, in Plato's cave or something where like, I, there's everything that I want, I kind of materialistically. Um, and even in a lot of ways, I've taken this to my, to my body itself and that I do a lot of physical training and have worked on my diet and my mental um, health um, as a um, like routine exercise to improve my, uh, con the condition of my life in, in many ways. But through making these things, I've, I've, I have a less, a, a less of an attachment to physical things. So I've been able to, my, Buy, uh, buy a new car, but I kind of don't like care anymore. <laughs> so I use Uber, <laughs> you know, and I think that's also an expression of our time because there's, there's, there's so much abundance yet people are still struggling. So I think it puts things into perspective about like what's really important and clearly it's just, it's health that mental and physical health are the only things that really matter. Well, you've already said you, you build things. Sculpture is your main field of work. You yeah. do other things too, filming, uh, painting. You've done a lot of things. But um, is sculpture a field that kind of allows more than others uh, for you to express like, you know, your inner contradictions of, you know, like, you know, growing up, not really being a master in anything. And, mm. you know, is sculpture something that is kind of more accessible in that sense? I think so. And also, the, to me, the definition of sculpture is very broad. Like, I read this, when I was in college, I read this essay called like, Sculpture in the Expanded Field by Rosalind Krauss. And there she talked about sculpture in very abstract terms and as one pile of description versus architecture and things that blended the two and getting into areas that are really too complicated for this conversation because it would take over, but things like minimal art or reduced art or specific objects like Donald Judd, like is it architecture or sculpture? And then I really around that time started to view everyday things as sculptures and like the comparison that we were talking about is between a sneaker and a cathedral and they're because because they're both objects of devotion. I'm mean, sure they're they're objects of utility, but they also work in a lot of the same ways that sculpture works in that they're objects of devotion. Yeah. And they're, and they're objects of, of faith in a specific culture or maybe even subculture. I don't know how to define that exactly. But that you can put as much care into either. Yeah. Um, I want to talk, I, I said I was going to ask you about your strategies. You've developed strategies, you know, um, your universe works along certain strategies. And uh, your work and your process is not only visible, but I, th I think it's also very tangible, even for people not working in art, like myself, for example, like a musician or a journalist, because you have strategies to guide you through working and creating, which is not always you know, I mean, no one gets up and is like, you know, every day paints the painting of their lifetimes. That's not how it works. You've developed strategies to help you get into that process. And some of them are in your 10 bullets, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But some of them are really simple, like being physically in touch with your work material, even if it's just pen and paper and the surface, the space that you work in. Yeah. Um, how how would you how would you say what what kind of a role does do these kind of simple things play for you? The the simple things of the materials you mean or yeah yeah and in creating a space where you can actually uh, work in you know and inspire yourself to work. Well, it's to me it's the like greatest luxury and pleasure of of my working life is um, is the the sensual. Um, uh, 
act of making. And in sculpture, they, there's um, reductive art where you chip away at a piece of stone till it looks like um, Michelangelo's David. And then there's ad additive art where you add clay like a Rodin till it looks like the thinker. And then there's bricolage, which is what we do here. And I mean, this is as good of a sculpture as any. And it's assembled of found things that are processed. And some of them are illusionistic. Like, like if that's a piece of wood that's painted to look like metal. And some of them are found, like the cane. And some of them are highly processed, like a bulletproof glass Lexan holder specifically cut out for this bottle or packet of cigarettes or a cigarette lighter. It's swollen over the past decade. <laughs> <Can I get> <laughs> <it>? <laughs> but uh, you know, for me, I think my my pleasure is combining these things and um, and also using what you have available. Yes, and or seeing potential in something that is usually used for something completely else. I think that's my area of of, of special joy. I think in art historical, you would art historically you might be you could call it like a assisted ready made. Like there's an, a ready made cane, but the, all the stuff around it, so that it's, it's partially. Is bricolage then? <laughs> I think in a lot of ways it's a it's a cousin of an assisted mm. ready-made because bricolage just means building or repairing with li uh, limited available resources. And although the resources have grown over the years, the still the um, approach of using things that have had a past life. Yeah. Like this little piece here um, was cut short, so a little piece was added, but it means you get an extra screw and a little seam and chipped wood. So that's way more interesting than something that's IKEA made. Yeah. Um, one of one of the rules that I think that that you uh, talked about sometimes is uh, you've got two jobs as an artist. Your number one job is doing your job, <laughs> and your second job is communicating that that job has been done. Is that what we're doing here right now? That's exactly what we're doing. Okay. Here right now. <laughs> um, we're combating jet lag to to share the vision, and but I also I, this is not limited to me. This is the thing that I I, I don't know if anyone from my team is is anyone from my team listening from the hardcore studio team in the background. We all know that half the job is doing it, and the other job is is saying that it's been done. Because if you do the job but you don't tell the other person, they're going to resent you and think you didn't do it. But if you do the job and brag about it, they're going to adore you for, for helping. And it's the same here. You know, we, we do it, but um, we can do it in a cave. Or we can make videos um, like the ten, 10 Bullets or any of the other films, studio films that share um, details. Or in, in the case of the studio films, we like to show the aspects of the sculptures that exist in, in time, right? So like you walk into this show, and it's just a bunch of inert sculpture, and then on Saturday for 10 hours we'll be activating it. And that's the um, ideal state is the activation, but also it's not because it's a brief moment in time. And these objects for the past few months without my activation have real sculptural quality that you can't see while we're performing with them because you can't get up close. Things are moving too quickly. Um, but the uh, utility the function, the evidence of all that is derived from the um, demonstration or the performative side. And so you need both, and they work well together. And I, 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 maybe it's a little complicated that something can exist in a, in a few different states, but um, that's also, to, to me, what makes it special. Talking about your team and your studio in New York, uh, which you once referred or sometimes referred to as a teaching hospital, which I think is very funny. Um, and it's, I think it's like a living sculpture of yours because it's always permeating and it's like always uh, in motion. Um, but at one point, um, your studio used to be just a sketchbook. Is that true? Yeah, sure. And, and, and you still use sketchbooks to this. I, it's one of the most important things. Like when you, if your studio was to burn down, you would run out with your sketchbooks. That's the most important thing because the ideas come from drawings. I mean, even yesterday in our meeting, I wrote down a couple of things, which I haven't, I was too drunk to <laughs> spend time researching them, but I'll get there. Um, yeah, the ideas all come from drawings. Um, 
because a drawing can happen in a few seconds and can be filled out with words and sketches, but then to realize it takes like kind of a lifetime. So in a sense, I, the only thing that I'm really attached to that I would not want to part with are those sketchbooks. I don't even look at them, to be honest. And I, um, but you know, even the physicality isn't as important as the information. I, a scan of them and a, a yeah. facsimile is good enough because it's not even the mark that's important, but the, the, the data, mm -hmm. the info. Edward Tufte talks about um, uh, screen resolution as a kind of getting very, it's, it's so good now that it's got about the same um, DPI or the same amount of resolution as a pencil now. We're, 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 we're about there. Yeah. I think it's, it's pretty much there. So um, it, it matters less and less. Apart from your sketchbook, like what would you say is your favorite tool in your whole studio? <sighs> Okay, I've got a list. Can I like indulge in this a little bit? You can, but I'm asking <laughs> for the favorite thing. The? <laughs> Is it the glue gun, maybe? I, don't know, I think it's going to be like a spork. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that conveys food to my belly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, the glue gun is, is a big one because um, it's like a, it's, it's very strong and very fast and kind of like de-skilled. And I like the idea of taking something that isn't really intended for a high level of craft and elevating it. That's sort of the approach that we take to plywood. Yeah, I remember you saying about the glue gun once that it represents failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can, How is that? Well, if you if you make it a, with a hot glue gun, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to have to fix it later. Right, that but, makes sense. But it gets you there, and the fix later is it in, comes in the form of a mending plate or a little piece of baling wire, and that's like an added layer. They say you know, measure twice and cut once, or there's never time to. The cynical carpenters say. Uh, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it again as an admonishment to young craftsmen. But I always say that as a, a positive thing, because if you have the opportunity to do it again, you can show the evidence that you were there. And in the aggregate, the amount, total amount of time might be the same, but you get something that has a little more humanity to it. Um, these are terrible lessons to teach. I, I don't want people working like that, but in a way that's an authentic way that I've been able to make things because in sculpture, make a lot of decisions and not a lot of them work out. So sometimes it's important to do a bad job so you can do it quickly and then you don't have to commit. There's this, um, uh, there's this thing called the sunk cost fallacy, which is means, um, well, I put all these hours into it, I might as well finish, but giving up's really important. I mean, true. in, in judo, you, if, you, you know, if you're beat, you, you have to surrender or you'll, you won't be able to fight the next round. Yeah. It's the same in art. Your studio uh, works according to the code that you set for it, which is the 10 bullets. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us in the audience uh, have seen those 10 bullets. Um, actually, if, if I have to, if I should be very honest, my first impression, you know, when uh, I interviewed you for the Das ist Kunst podcast last year, and I was told, you better watch those 10 bullets. Otherwise, he might like tear you apart or something. <laughs> so I watched the 10 bullets and I tried to memorize as much as I could. I think I've watched, watched them three times, maybe. <laughs> but I, was still, I still found it very intimidating. And I was like, oh, is he going to test me on it? Like, what, what, am I, what, what can I expect? And then my fifth impression kind of was, uh, no, these 10 bullets are actually a genius move. <laughs> They're a genius move to gather not only your team in your studio around you, but also like kind of convey to anyone outside like how you work, how the system Tom Sachs works. Um, is it like also a testimony, those 10 bullets, of how much importance your team has for your work? Maybe, maybe we should say one more thing, if anyone isn't familiar with the 10 bullets, it's rules. It's like guidelines that are set in Tom's studio that everyone should be working according to. Some of them are really simple, like be on time, get a receipt when you send something, um, be thorough, 
also be gnawing, be gnawing, always be gnawing, like sorting things, uh, you know, tidying up the workplace. How, like, how much importance does do these ten bullets have in your everyday, like, studio work life? Well, 10 bullets, and if you haven't seen them, watch them. It's on YouTube or at 10bullets.com. Um, and it's uh, 17 minutes long or something. And the, it's sort of like, at the, the, I made it for interns. Because everyone in the studio has, at one point, been an intern. Even Aram. Um, and it's sort of like the movie they show you in your first day at McDonald's where they, OK, now you got to mop the restaurant, and here's how you do it because there's an art to mopping a restaurant, for sure. Um, how to Sweep, right? That was a yep. movie that was running here in the re-education. Yep. Yep. Uh, and How to Sweep is like the, it's, like the, it's one of the sequel movies. There are a bunch right. of movies around yeah. 10 Bullets, and that's, but that's a great one. How to Sweep is very critical. You can learn. I, I work with someone who um, his interview process is he, he asks someone to, to sweep the shop. <laughs> and he just watches. That's how you sweep. get the job as an intern. <laughs> well, it, it, at my French show, he, he runs mm -hmm. like a um, super high-end um, uh, race car, um, a place where they make motors for race cars, and they hop up, they do like million-dollar cars. And his, that's, because most people fail that, and then so he, he doesn't have to go through the rest of the interview process because they don't, they're not thorough. That's really mainly about being thorough. But the, the um, Ten Bullets is more like the Ten Commandments. It's an impossible thing to follow, but it's a compass. It's a guide to, uh, to get you going in the right direction. And from like an angry old like sea captain like me, it also gives me a sense of vindication when someone's screwing something up. I can point to one of those bullets and scream at them with impunity, um, hey, you know, bullet number seven. Because, uh, right, the ninth bullet is uh, about Leatherface, right? Yeah. Because uh, Leatherface, the Leatherface figure, which is actually living right here in uh, Deichtohain right now, back there. Um, because we are here. Be yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously because we're here. And um, you have to redeem yourself to Leatherface if you are late, if you leave lights on in the studio, et cetera, and Leatherface collects funds for those kind of, uh, you know, uh, wrongdoings. Yeah. Um, and in the 10 bullets, you say that with the funds, you usually have a party at some point. Oh, we, we always have a party. We always spend the money. <laughs> but it, it's really a way of helping people shit together because the fines double every time. So if you leave the lights on, like a hundred times. What was the most someone ever had to pay for leaving the lights well, on? Well, it's funny. So I mentioned Aram Shah, who's, a, who's like the president of the, stu of the studio. And I can't remember what it was, but she kept doing the same thing over and over again. And it was like 20 bucks, 40 bucks. And then it was like 80 bucks. And at 80 bucks, it's like you might as well like not work there anymore because it's kind of approaching what you're making almost. And I remember there was something about, um, I think she probably forgot to put something in the calendar because that was her job was entering things, which, and we all live and die by the calendar. The calendar is everything. We can talk about that. And I remember we had a conversation where it was like, okay, what are we going to do? And it was, it was a, I think they call it like a come to Jesus moment where there was an epiphany. And she basically broke Leatherface. But through that, we found a way of, we found a detente, and, and she stopped um, forgetting to put things and in the calendar. parties were had, nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, just to really, uh, like, I wanted to jump to yeah. something completely yeah. differently right now. Um, <laughs> while we were talking about partying, you made a surf trip mm -hmm. with your studio team into what was supposed to be a working trip a couple years ago, not too long ago, I think two years ago or something. Um, you went on a surfing trip to Bali with a crew from your New York studio, and you all wanted to learn how to surf. You've been surfing for a long time, you told me. Um, but initially, you made the mistake of mistaking learning to surf as work, and you found out surfing is not work. Right. So I. Uh, like you, I'm an A-type personality. You watched Ten Bullets how many times before? Or a couple. A couple <laughs> times. Do you think you said five, I think? <laughs> but my point is you're a prepared person. And um, 
I wanted to uh, learn how to surf or teach some of my team how to surf, and I wanted to improve my surfing. So we went to the best, one of the best places on earth, Bali, Indonesia, and we had a uh, professional surfing sponsor, Hurley, one of the big brands in surfing, and we had pro surfers and vans and airplanes and food. It was like a well-funded, correct thing. And I was like, oh, we'll just apply our usual um, type A obsessive personality thing to this task that we've assigned, which is learning to surf, and uh, failed miserably because uh, surfing is... Um, I mean, unless you're an elite, uh, an elite level where it's like a um, competitive sport like any other, um, it's a leisure activity. And um, it's got a particularly high learning curve, unlike soccer where anyone can just kick at the ball and you know it has to go into that net and not go into yours. That's it. Um, and uh, found it very frustra frustrating to the point where, um, and of course, because some days surfing, it can be very difficult because it's nature and the conditions aren't, uh, unless you're in Hawaii. Um, but even then, if you're on the North Shore during January, you know, it's elite level, so it's not for beginners. Um, I think it was a, a, a great lesson that we all learned about um, What's why do you do things? You know, I do things for pleasure, for work, and and uh, for me, it's all the same. But with surfing, it was a little different because there was no um, output, there was no measure of success. It was just this hedonistic experience, so that was very hard to quantify, um, especially when I had so much pleasure in making. Um, shaker furniture in my garage. And you also have uh, a lot of fun finding uh, shit, if I may say. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I found the uh, challenge that your team uh, talked about there pretty uh, interesting. They always send you, like when you're traveling, they send you into local drugstores and grocery stores because you're the person who can find the coolest thing in any store. Is that true? I'm, <laughs> I am a, as you know, I'm um, a, a pretty like, serious um, critic of consumerism. But in order to be a true critic, you have to also be an active participant. So yeah, I will find the one good thing um, in any store, whether it's Chanel that day or a drugstore in Indonesia. Um, there's always something special in any environment. And the ultimate expression of that is, is people. And the the thing that I think I am best at is, is picking good people. Um, the studio team, uh, the Dijkstra Holland team, um, and, and like learning to work with them, but, but selecting the one person out of a crowd. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about terms uh, that are often used, that you often use, and that are also often used to describe your work and also what I would call your theory of practice. Um, authenticity, intuition, um, transparency. Mm. And in, in what way do you think, um, do these things work together? Authenticity is, is building something for yourself with what you have available and having it become real by that, if I understand correctly. Is that, yeah. is that what authenticity means to you? Well, maybe. I would I, I, probably. I think for me, authenticity is, is finding a way to make something that's like a true expression of yourself. So. I keep going back to the examples before us of like the table um, th that uh, I, I am like impulsive. So measuring once and cutting twice um, and having the mark and the evidence of the earlier wrong cut um, brings information. And it's transparent because it shows what happened, 
but it's a way of um, bearing myself like naked. In, in craft, there's a thing where you, uh, there's a tradition that's hunt thousands of years old about erasing the evidence of your work. And that's what finish is, uh, paint. And that's why we always paint the material first and then cut it so you can see what happened. A normal craftsman would make the whole thing and then paint it to hide everything. And people come into the studio and say, are, is it done? Are you, when are you going to paint it, paint over all that work? And earlier in my career, I, I made things like that where I'd paint over the work and, and then I would regret it immediately. Those were some of my failures. And that's, that's also kind of why you always talk of the tragedy of the iPhone, right? Because that's, that's this thing that no one can tell that a human has touched it in order to make it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do, it, there is something tragic about it, but it's also something wonderful. I would, I would, I would never accept an iPhone that, had, that was new, that, that had a flaw on it. I mean, I, I accept a lot of problems with Apple products, but they're also, nothing's better. The, the, I mean, a computer is an artificial brain, so there are a lot of problems. Like, I still don't understand why the um, eighth-inch headphone jack isn't there anymore, and it's like a big problem. If anyone from I Apple's, feel like other people have those problems here too. Is anyone else <laughs> annoyed by that? Okay, so we got a lot of hands here. So <laughs> Apple, listen up. You know, is it a, is it still is it is it a professional product if you cannot have it plugged into your mixing board and charged at the same time? Can you can, are you allowed to call it a pro, an iPad Pro? If you because because we can't do that now. But if you talk to people at Apple, they'll they're looking for um, something that's beautiful and sleek and lighter, b better battery. So there's always a trade-off. It's not I think. These, these, these ideas are, I know we're talking about Apple now, not me, but, uh, but in any system, whether it's Apple's system or mine, there are, all, there are always trade-offs. And I think there are warring um, values in a, a company as large as Apple or Nike, there are different camps. And in the studio, thank God it's a dictatorship. Talking about... Um, Oops, did I say dictatorship in Germany? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, warring, warring terms are things yeah. that are like not so easy to uh, pin down. Um, intuition and creativity. There's a saying of yours yeah. that you, that's everywhere. It, it's creativity is the enemy. And, you know, uh, for me, someone not coming from an art context, I'm like, what? He's an artist. Why is he saying that creativity <laughs> is the enemy? I do not understand. I understand now because uh, you've explained it to me. But um, creativity, you say, should be seen as a discipline and something that does not... Uh, you know, is not better than persistence, mm. if I understand correctly. Yeah. I, I think when we say creativity is the enemy, we mean it. Um, uh, creativity is kind of like chili pepper. You, can, you only need a little bit. What you really need is a lot of good meat or pasta or whatever to support it, otherwise, otherwise known as hard work. And... Um, a little creativity goes a long way. You can't have no creativity, but there is caprice and indulgence and whimsy that are used to mask hard work. There is flowery language and excessive words used to hide lack of ideas. Um, you know, you kind of got to do your push-ups and, and build strong. Um, you have to put in the hours. Yeah. You have to put in the work. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's not even that you have to, it's that you get to. It's, that's the privilege. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter what you do, like whether you're an artist or a lawyer, it's how you do it. I mean, B Joseph Boyes said, everyone's an artist, and I, I believe that. Um, you know, we're different kinds of artists, but I, but I know that you work hard in everything that you do, and that's, I think, why we have a connection because you apply that to this interview and your preparation for it as you do to your st stage life as a musician. Yeah, and I was, uh, I kind of was reminded of that because music is definitely one thing where you have to put in the hours. 
And um, music also plays a really big role in your whole universe. Um, you have an obsession with good sound systems and uh, you cherish the analog artifact of boom boxes. You built a lot of boom boxes, speakers. Um, and it, music has an important part in your studio atmosphere too. Um, artists like James Brown, he's in the 10 bullets, um, for example, but also Reggie, Lee Scratch Perry told me, um, and it, it, I mean, that's music, and it often appears like as a role model or also like an ideal in your instructional works like the Ten Bullets. Um, in what ways would you say that these kind of artists, like James Brown and his like mastery of soul and funk, in what ways is that inspirational to you as an artist doing completely different things? Well, it's, you know, the only thing I really collect, I don't collect art or anything, is, is music, and I struggle because it's now it's Spotify and it's hard because the computers are changing so quickly and even my record collection's like a mess. Um, and we have a lot of music here in, in the live demonstration on Saturday. Um, James Brown was the original uh, idea behind um, Leatherface because he fined his musicians for missing a beat or not having their shoes shined. And um, Although I think that's like the absolute opposite of um, team building, um, you know, and Brown was famous for never really having the same band. It was always a bunch of different people, and I think he suffered. Alienating for people. Sorry. Uh, alienating people yeah. a lot. Yeah. And 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 then they would go and start their own thing. But uh, also the thing about James Brown, and he's a you know fraught with all kinds of problems. So he's not a perfect hero, um, but he worked so hard and, f and invented his own way of, of uh, seeing the world, and, and all, all the greats do that, but there was something about his um, approach that was so far out, that was so spectacular in like at least five different genres that um, he is a kind of a hero of, um, you know, of, of, ext of an extreme degrees. I mean, even in, including all of his failures and embarrassments, there were outrageous, uh, you know, getting into high-speed pursuits with the police and like not surrendering until they shot his tires out, like crazy stuff. But um, inventing, you know, hip hop, rap, disco, soul, funk, yeah, break dancing, whatever. Speaking of um, heroes and, and icons, um, there's some names that are regularly dropped by yourself or also by others referring to your universe. Um, and I'm just going to drop them too because mm. I know nothing about these people. Oh. I looked up some of them. Yeah. Um, but um, I just want to know like Brancusi, mm. Le Corbusier, uh -huh. Charles Eames, uh -huh. and uh, you just mentioned to me uh, Saul LeWitt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is putting yourself in relation to, to some of these influential artists, is that something that was important to you in your own development? Like creating a lineage for yourself, kind of, that's what I would think. Or is that something that we journalists do? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, each one of those people that you mentioned are, are, are heroes to me. And we also talked about Yoko Ono in that list. Right, too. Yoko Ono, yeah. Um, and, and there are many, many more, and a lot of them are on, um, there's a Saks family crest in the gallery at the end there, and it's a big blue painting, and you can see a lot of their names, and they're also mixed in with brands and uh, ideas, philosophies. Um, uh, I, I'm interested in the mythologies of all these people. Someone like James Brown was just a person, you know, he, he led an extraordinary life, um, uh, and his his problems were were um, not as even though he was famous for them were were nothing compared to his achievements. Um, we talk about uh, Brancusi as this incredible artist, like maybe the first I don't know maybe the first abstract artist, depending on how you define what abstract means, um, or like the edge of abstraction, something like that. Um, uh, uh, you know, he he walked from um, Bucharest to Paris, and then 
carved all of his sculptures by hand and uh, had a big beard and was like this monk-like character. So the, um, uh, the legend and the icons of l larger than life, even a hundred years later, we're talking about this mythic figure and the, um, the mythology of the human behind the art has always been really interesting to me with figures like, um, like Brancusi and even Le Corbusier, the, you know, this guy who, who gave himself a name like the crow, right? Like someone just, like, one day you're going to wake up and call yourself the crow or Cher. You know, there are very few people who have one name things, but it's, uh, there was an idea behind it and I, I admire that. I don't know if I could ever do that, but I, maybe we found our way through the 10 bullets cult um, to create um, some of that, that um, uh, mythic iconography, but we do it really just to further build the values of the studio. It's not really about me. Um, it's more just about the, the ideas and, and we are just, um, part of a continuum. I mean, a lot of the values of, this, of the studio now are taken from the Eames studio in Santa Monica, California, or Venice, California, and a lot of the ideas that you could be a studio that makes um, movies and furniture and architecture and communication systems and, and art. I mean, these are a lot of the values that, that we share. And also that the Eames studio wasn't just Charles Eames, it was his partner, Ray Eames, and all the people that work there. And I've got a great book that's like a coffee table book and it's got every, it's like, and it was Ray, after Charles died, Ray um, made a book of all their projects and named everyone who worked on every project. And it's, it's almost microfiche, it's tiny, but it is the compendium. And I always thought that was a beautiful, way for her to end her life um, by pulling it all together in a very easy yeah. way. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the paradox bullets too. Mm. Um, paradox bullets uh, is a sequel kind of to the 10 bullets film was released some time ago and it's also one of these movies that kind of outlines your studio's signature uh, philosophies or techniques, I would say, um, Paradox Bullets. Um, and these films have really made the studio as intriguing as the sculptures that it produces, I would say. And it also, they invite, I think, viewers and visitors to uh, feel like a part of your team by, you know, reflecting on those, uh, on those techniques and reflecting on your kind of philosophy. Um, I uh, wanted to do that initially when we started the talk, but I, I came up with this new name for you because you know you have so many names. You're the handyman of uh, high art. <laughs> uh, you're a shaman, you're uh, an alchemist. Um, and I think that you're kind of a post-structuralist rock star of sculpture, <laughs> if I may say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's like I'm honored. that's like what I came up with. I don't know. I'm, I'm honored, um, but thank you. And Thanks. why? It's I think it's because you've made a, a religion and an art out of subverting dualisms, and that's where the paradox bullets come in. Um, you know, because post-structural thought challenges uh, what comes to be accepted as truth and knowledge in Western discourse. And I felt like when I saw the paradox bullets, I felt like that's exactly what they're doing. Um, breaking up these dualisms of either or. You know, paradox bullets, for example, they say, um, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Or if at first you don't succeed, try again and don't try again, both is valid. Um, Give up immediately or, yeah. or, per, or persist, yeah. How would, how, what would you say, what was your, what were you thinking? What was your intention with the paradox bullets? Well, first of all, and maybe maybe add a few more. I only yeah, had yeah. a couple of them. Well, first of all, thank you for um, this new title, which I accept. Is it um, new? I don't know. It's so. Yeah, the, <laughs> what did you say? The the post-structuralist rock star of sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like blushing. It's incredible. Okay. But yeah, I mean, the and the key and a part of post-structuralism that I understand is um, plur plurality, right? That's the, to me the active word and it's not either or but and, 
and is an important, um, I don't know, it's almost like a verb that you must do them both at the same time. I don't know semantically how to describe it, but um, uh, I guess there are two little anecdotes. I'll try and say them quickly, but one is a, there's a rule, um, uh, an unspoken rule um, for YouTube film directors, thou shalt not read thy comments because it's the most racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, like worst place and you find like the, the, the anonymity brings out the, like, the, the, the id people. And um, so, of course, after 10 bullets, I've read every single comment. Um, and uh, the thing that I learned is that the internet, I think ultimately because it's a computer, which has to, is, is in essence one or zero, it's a switch, it's on or off, it is either or. It's, you know, maybe AI is going to make it both, but I think at the core, even when a computer generates a random number, it's not r truly random. It just works. It's effectively random, but I feel like mathematically it isn't. So I think on some, uh, I don't know, genetic level, it's, 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 it's binary. So maybe that's it, or just people are jerks. Anyway, the thing that I learned is that people love certainty over truth. And that's why they elect assholes like Donald Trump and like Putin or whatever. Like they, they, they want a story told to them and they want to believe. People want to believe and this has been going since the beginning of time. Um, uncertainty is much scarier and much more challenging. And I think like in 10 bullets there's a Elsa does a solder job and it's a very peculiar way of soldering and it's how we do it in the studio and it's not normal. And people get so mad. They want to kill me because of the way she solders in that. Really? Yeah, that or else they like, they can, and then the next comment is something about her panty lines that you can see. <laughs> you know, it's like, so uh, 10 bullets, uh, I mean, paradox bullets in a way was my answer to that. It was for, for every bullet, the opposite is equally valid. Um, Just not for beyond time, right? <laughs> You know, beyond time is a really complex one because yeah. you really what do. What is time? <laughs> you, you do need to be on time, but yeah. I mean, I break that one all. That's the one that I'm guilty of breaking all the time because I'm sometimes late because I'm I'm really focused on the thing that I'm doing and I don't want to stop and I'm keep at it. And you must also sometimes give up immediately and do something else and let your mind think about it and come around. Yeah, it is. It is not either or, it's, it's both at a certain point in time. And, and I think it's also worth noting that the psychedelic experience, um, which is a window into other worlds, helps you to see that. Mm. I mean, and, and the psychedelic experience ranges from powerful drugs like psilocybin or LSD or ketamine to the um, surreal experience that we have every night where we go into this place where uh, nothing makes sense, yet everything makes sense, and then we have almost immediate amnesia. Um, that's why we do, that's why I try not to look at my phone first thing in the morning. I'll try and write down some notes, either about my dreams or just do output before input. Output before input, yeah. That's a good strategy. It's, because it's hard. A, it's hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a discipline, but it's, it's the best way to have a connect. And whatever you do in life, it's the best way to have connection to your subconscious state, to this incredibly powerful, um, surreal motor that you possess. The, the brain, the part of you that's simultaneously resting and making sense of the part of your um, life that makes no sense. Like, our lives are crazy if you start to describe all the wonderful, weird, horrible things that happen in our life, but our subconscious mind is a way of processing that. Let's talk about build it and they will come mm. because we're all here right now because you built all this with your team. Um, the space program. Uh, the first space program was 2007 to the moon. Um, second one was 2011 to Mars. Now we're here at Deichtwahan and uh, we already witnessed a mission to, to Vesta at the start of this. Um, how did how did that mission go? Why why um, why we're going to Vesta again, or you're going to Vesta again on Saturday? Um, what are we what are we doing on Vesta? 
What are we looking for? Well, so we went, but we're going again. It's the same mission, but um, itchy go, itchy a. We all might be in the same room together, um, again, doing the same thing, but it will be a different experience. We've got uh, uh, two different astronauts, B. Speederman and Laura Kampf, and these astronauts are um, training as we speak and are... But, but why to Vesta? What? Oh, why Vesta, right. Yeah, okay. why Vesta? Sorry. Oh, we're going to Vesta, which is an asteroid <clears throat> between, in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, it's like the fourth largest one. And we're going there um, in uh, search of rare earth elements. So why? Because we make one and a half billion cell phones a year. And um, that's like enough gold, just gold alone. To the, it's, it's, it's bigger than the vertical assembly building. It's a huge chunk of gold. So we're running out of resources here on Earth where things are becoming more and more precious. So we're going to this other planet to feed our addiction. I mean, uh, we are all individually addicted to our custom-made uh, rectangle. Um, I've experimented with every drug and I've not had, you know, like issues with addiction, but I cannot beat this one. It's really got me. It's custom made to appeal to my weakest impulses. Here in the transubstantiation part of uh, this space program, people could let go of their cell phone and have it be destroyed and only, uh, you know, their SIM card remain. Did anyone do that? Did you further uh, your uh, Annette, has anyone, endeavors? Has anyone done it? <laughs> yeah, so Annette, yes, we have at least one okay, person. So we have one some, person that... Uh, and, <laughs> and it's a... So let go of their cell phone. A, a friend asked me, well, Tom, you're not authentic if you don't do it. And so, and so I did it, but I almost immediately had one of my assistants go to the Apple store and get me a new phone. So I didn't really do it because I realized that I'm completely addicted to it. And also my part of my job is, now I'm justifying, um, is, is I'm a communications artist right, right now, speaking to you. Um, I have gone for a week without my phone, but only in nature. As like as as and I think a lot of us have done it. I think it's very hard to be in a um, uh, urban setting or an environment where we're um, engaging with others without the device, with a, you know, without an, the ability to Uber or research um, an opening uh, or closing hours of a museum or get a train ticket or uh, rendezvous with a friend. Could you imagine rendezvousing with someone without using your phone today? Or how, right, you know, how do you imagine, I guess. How do you do it? I, or, and it might not even be possible because the, you couldn't send a postcard and um, you, uh, they wouldn't understand how it's like a, we're speaking a different language. But the, the addiction's real and it's a problem because it blocks access to our, our, our creative pathways and it blocks access to our understanding of ourself. Um, and so the answer is discipline. You know, if you talk to a really smart person or maybe an, uh, a, uh, an older person who's not a native, a digitally native, you might say, just, uh, you know, read a damn book or uh, just look at it less. But the power of the algorithm, and there's a great movie about it, um, the, the, is it the social problem? Is it called the social problem? The social network? This, is it social yeah, network? network? And it talks, it goes, and it's, and it's great. They're showing it in schools. Uh, I think it's fantastic. But um, uh, so in a way, there's no escape. But this, this piece, this whole room, in a way, is, is my um, attempt to try and come to terms with, those, with that addiction. So do you think uh, this, uh, your space program can play a role in kind of reflecting and negotiating both our own behaviors within like this capitalist uh, system that, you know, um, there's an increasing request for raw materials, you know, for cell phones, for everything. And um, do you think uh, your space program can kind of negotiate our behaviors within this system and also be a critique of this system? 
Well, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's interesting that uh, there, aren't there are not treatment programs for this. I mean, there are plenty of treatment programs to get you on Prozac so that you can show up at your work and keep the system going, but there, isn't a, there aren't a lot of treatments to help you um, get in touch with your creativity or, um, or to help you understand that you turn to your device when you're down and out because it all keeps the system running. Um, and I've spoken to people in the tech community and they have all, at the big companies like Apple and Google and Facebook, they've all looked into it, but it is simply deprioritized because it's against profit. Um, I, I think there is an opportunity um, because you're not going to stop people, but there is an opportunity to make lives better. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are some if there are some moves being made. Um, there's another great movie um, called Lo and Behold, which is the other credible, there are only two credible movies about the internet, and, that, and the first one is Lo and Behold by Werner Herzog, where he investigates all this stuff, but this is probably five or six years old, which is an eternity by now. I think the values in it are, are, are true, but when you watch it, you'll see how dated it feels because we've all moved along so, so much with, with uh, social media. So I kind of, um, I want to talk about uh, your mission commander um, yeah. for this mission, but before, just one last Bet question. You do. When you started your space program, space players, uh, Branson and Musk, uh, they were already on the horizon. Now they've both uh, rocketed themselves into space. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, uh, yeah, I, yes, I, you know, I... Yeah, so they were like my competition. Um, but I think they're in a way doing a less good job. Um, I think they've got a hard, they've got a lot more ahead of them. I mean, do they have a bar in their landing module? I don't no, think so. I, I don't Pro think probably not, who knows, I don't know. I mean, I think there, there's, there are a lot of things that a space program is and um, part of it is rockets and, but part of it is communication and understanding why we go to other worlds to answer the big questions, are we alone? Where did we come from? Um, and I think that a lot of those guys are just having like a small penis contest about like <laughs> who's gonna get their rocket off the ground first, but they're missing a, the, the essential opportunity and that's to discuss what's going on with our planet. And they're not, em they're not embracing the, um, the essential um, problem of how we're destroying this planet. And there is very little communication in their efforts about let's just say the overview effect, the idea of looking back on Earth. And I was invited to go on a SpaceX mission and I did initial training and I was selected and made it like pretty far before I, I quit because I don't want to spend what's left of my short life training for that mission. Um, I want to like enjoy all the corners of Earth. I want to, ex I want to experience Hamburg in the rain one more day and then it's sitting <laughs> in a capsule yeah. with a bunch of... Weird. And also run your own mission. Yeah. And, and run your own mission. But, uh, but I, I think th th there is a, an opportunity and I think it's not too late for these guys to, to look at Earth and to understand from space how precious and rare it is. And also what's maybe uh, what the problem is or what's going wrong with, with us on Earth, right? Well, I mean, uh, or, uh, from space, you can't see borders. There are no passports from yeah. space. There, there's, yeah. there's, yeah. So let's talk about yeah. Laura Kampf. Oh, yeah. Your mission commander, inventor, maker of awesome things from Cologne, Germany. Uh, Laura Kampf uh, will be commander of the mission on Saturday to Vesta. Um, and I feel like she has some mantras. Uh, if you look at her YouTube videos, you can see her mantras in her studio, which I think they, they reminded me of yours, basically. Like, uh, every defect gets respect. Um, let glue dry. What the fuck, let glue dry? Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you two, how did this come about? Never orders, only favors. Which is another way of saying, you know, doing it for, for love, for the right reason. So, um, Laura is my soul sister, and we met, I think we met through the internet. I mean, we both are YouTubers. She's a huge star 
Um, and if you don't know, um, Laura Kampf on YouTube, start, because she's the best maker on YouTube. Um, I, want, I, want, I told her I want to buy her coffee grinder that she made out of old windshield wipers. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I can buy that at some point. <laughs> yeah, I think, you could, I think you could talk to her, but I have a feeling you two can make a deal. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, Laura is one of the most capable, smartest, kindest people I've ever met, hardworking. And um, her idea of a vacation is coming to the studio to volunteer and, 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 and be part of th this mission. Um, and I can't imagine a better commanding officer who handles um, heavy lifting with um, grace and elegance and, uh, and, and will not stop until it's done. Um, so, I don't know if I saw her walking by, but you'll, you'll all see her. Uh, actually, if anyone wants to find out more about Laura Kampf in the latest episode of the podcast, uh, Das ist Kunst, of Deichtorhain, I got to talk with Laura Kampf about her work and about how she is preparing for her first mission on Saturday. Oh, well. <laughs> which, uh, which I think uh, brings us uh, to the end and... Um, oh, just, just one last thing. Um, um, and don't miss that because Laura's great, but we should actually give a shout out to Laura's lieutenant, B. Speederman, oh, yeah. who um, also started as intern in the studio. Um, about eight years ago, and has done a lot, had a lot of different roles, and is now head of sculpture, which is the hardest job in the world. You are guaranteed to fail um, at this job, and she knows it, but it's just a question of how you fail. Her predecessor um, was Sam Ritanarat, who's leading the space program. She's the main Capcom capsule communicator, and Sam also was an astronaut on the Mars mission in 2012. Sam's left. She's graduated and is going to MIT in the fall. And, um, or Yale, I don't know. I think they got to whoever's going to, we'll see who wants her more. Um, but uh, I'm just very honored to be surrounded by such a great team. I just want to give those two a shout out. Ja, das äh, Space-Programm von Tom Sachs wird mit einer Space-Mission zu Four Vesta, dem hellsten Asteroiden, der von der Erde aus sichtbar ist, schließen. Und zwar diesen Samstag übermorgen um 10 Uhr. Thank you. Tom, thank you. Danke, danke. Where's the drink?